next cloud security masterclass. This one focused on taking a deep dive into the security of Amazon S3. Uh, want to let you know about a couple of upcoming masterclass sessions uh, this Tuesday. Uh, we have a conversation with Greg McCord, the global head of information security at CalAMP, the company behind Lojack. I think that's going to be a, a really exciting conversation. Um, so do tune into that. And then uh, later in June on the 23rd, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the security of AWS IAM. So uh, please join that as well. Let's move on to the agenda. Um, so we hope that the, the, the masterclass uh, series is going to be useful for you and, and that you'll find it quite unique and, uh, and a bit fun as well. Um, just brief, briefly about the agenda, um, Josh Stella, my co-founder here at Fugue, is going to take a, a quick look at why cloud security is different. Um, and then we're going to jump right into a deep dive into Amazon S3 and, and the security there. Um, and then we'll get to your uh, questions and answers. But really, I want to let everybody know, one, uh, the chat is open throughout the whole session. So please get your questions and comments in at any time. Uh, my colleague Sivia and I will be hanging out in the chat, um, helping to facilitate those questions to Josh. So we want this to be really uh, open and uh, engaging for everybody involved. We are recording this, so this session will be available to you, uh, um, I, I believe, probably tomorrow. Um, and so with that, I will throw it over to Josh. Let's do this. Thank you, Sivia. Thank you, Drew. So as Drew said, this is our first uh, cloud security masterclass in a series. Uh, we, so you're, you're, we're experimenting on you a little here today. Uh, but for, I wanted to start out by talking about what, you know, what we mean by this. Uh, so what do we mean by a cloud security masterclass? Um, it's technical deep dives into critical cloud uh, security subjects today. The first one, of course, on S3. Um, and we'll do more of those. It's, uh, we're going to have uh, really cool conversations with cloud security leaders, folks uh, in, in the space that have a little different perspective than, than I might or that we might. And I think more than anything, in my mind, a uh, cloud security masterclass should help you learn to think about the topic. So, you know, when you talk about mastery of a subject, what you're really talking is about, in my view, is a deep enough knowledge of the subject and familiarity with it to make your own decisions, uh, to not rely on, you know, imitation, to not rely on going by the book. So um, I'm a musician. And when you first start learning music, you're learning other people's stuff, right? But eventually, you want to be able to write or to improvise. And that, to me, is what, what mastery is about. So I can't impart to you that. You have to do that. But hopefully, uh, these classes will help you uh, kind of start engaging in that. Um, and one other thing that you, you have to be doing if you want to develop mastery of any subject, in my opinion, is have fun. You know, it needs to be engaging and interesting and a puzzle you want to solve or something you want to do on your own time, something that, that really uh, sparks a fire with you. And so my personal goal in this is for each of you who are attending uh, to get excited about the topic and to get uh, much smarter at it and to dig deeper. I personally find this stuff absolutely fascinating and fun and interesting. And we're gonna to try to kind of communicate that uh, through the class. So uh, hopefully we, we pull that off. Um, what it's not, we're not really gonna do step-by-step -step tutorials. This is not about uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb. This is about understanding the topic, being able to reason about the topic on your own. Uh, we're not gonna cover in depth specific use cases. We'll use some to help illustrate the path through the information that you need to, to gain that mastery over. Um, and it's not about slideshows, even though I'm showing you a slide. And hopefully, it's not boring. Um, OK, a little on a, a survey we did recently uh, here at Fugue about how, how much people are concerned with cloud misconfiguration vulnerabilities. And 
according to our survey respondents, and we do these surveys about once a year of you know hundreds of uh, uh, large scale you know users of cloud. Um, and 84% said they were concerned they've been hacked and don't know it. 92% are concerned they're vulnerable. And 76% think misconfiguration risk will increase or stay the same this year. I want to pry into that a little bit. Concerned they've been hacked and don't know it. 84%. That tells you something about the nature of cloud security. Um, cloud security is, is very different than data center security. It's really about the configuration of services. And the reason we chose S3 to go first is that's the one that usually comes to people's minds first when thinking about, you know, uh, where the data is going to get stolen from. And they're not wrong. It very often is coming from S3. Um, so we're going to try to help you understand why that is. And, and how to really uh, wrap your head around, you know, uh, getting that secure. 92% um, concerned they're vulnerable to a cloud breach. That's a good number. I suspect the 8% that said they weren't are getting hacked uh, because that shows a certain kind of um, overconfidence. We should all be concerned with this. It's really hard uh, to get this right. And misconfiguration risk going up, I think, you know, that's just clearly true as new services are added, as new features are added, one of the things I'll show you in S3, which you know, launched in 2006, so it's what, 14 years old. And over that time, all kinds of layers and features have been added that actually create a very complex landscape for misconfiguration. So Dave Linthicum at InfoWorld said, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of cloud configuration errors in the real world and it's scaring the hell out of me. Um, he's right. So a little bit about how the bad guys do this. So the pre-cloud exploit strategy um, was really to first identify a target. And kind of a classic example of this was North Korea going after Sony, right? Sony Pictures made a movie that the North Korean government didn't like. And so uh, North Korea targeted Sony and set out to, to steal their data for a particular purpose. So they started searching for vulnerabilities. In that case, it was a lot of human vulnerabilities, you know, spear phishing people and so on. And uh, that does happen, right? That, that makes the news, that does still happen. By far, the way it usually happens now is not that. It's that the bad guys have automated using bots, using, using scripts and automation, looking for vulnerabilities anywhere on an internet connected endpoint and collecting a list of the ones that have known vulnerabilities and then going shopping from that list in the morning with their coffee to decide who to hack today. So the, uh, the big, we, we know from the Department of Justice filings, for example, that the big Capital One breach, that's how, that's how she did that, is uh, by finding a, a known vulnerability and then exploiting it. She actually target Capital One. But what that means is, no matter who you are, the bad guys are looking at you. There is no obscurity. And S3 is a major attack surface uh, for just this kind of thing. So as John Breeden says here, skilled and well-funded hacker groups are employing automation to discover and exploit misconfigured as cloud assets within hours of their deployment. I think he's a little um, naive. It's minutes, not hours. It's minutes. So it's extremely important, and maybe even seconds in some cases. It's extremely important to not have the vulnerabilities up front uh, to prevent them getting out there because your reaction time is not going to be as fast as, uh, as the bad guys. All right, we're going to do a deep dive on the security of Amazon S3. I'm going to go out of slideshow mode here and we will spend most of this session actually at the AWS uh, console and at um, uh, the AWS documentation for S3. So um, I have up here a, a diagram that uh, we at Feud create, and I'm going to keep referring back to it as I'm showing you what I'm doing in the cloud. Um, but the format today is going to be, I'm going to create a new S3 bucket. And as I have, uh, as I create that bucket and adjust the settings, as I go through the process of creation, I'm going to explain to you what those things mean. 
Now that sounds like it should be obvious, but there's tons of devils living in details. Uh, Richard Feynman once famously said that anyone who tells you they fully understand quantum mechanics doesn't understand quantum mechanics. Uh, the same is kind of true about S3 security. And the reason is um, it has so many layers that interact on its security. And it has so many interrelationships with other services and so, so many use cases and features. So you really have to develop a kind of uh, uh, full reasoning ability about all those layers, how they interact, which are appropriate to use, et cetera. So I'm gonna walk through that. That's gonna be the majority of this session. At the end, we're gonna do some whiteboarding together. This is an experiment, we're all remote. I love teaching classes in a room with a real whiteboard, but I'm gonna try it here. And we're gonna use the chat where I'm gonna ask you to come back to me with some of the information that I shared, right? I'm gonna ask you some questions. And uh, we're also, uh, it's, it's not a, a quiz for score, um, but it is, uh, it, it is going to be something where we're, we're looking for you because that's an important part of learning to retain that information and reply to us uh, as a whiteboarding session with how we might do some things and some of the information that we, uh, uh, we put across. We're also gonna, if you've been to our webinars before, you'll know, or our sessions before this being a master class, anytime we do these online events, we like to have a little bit of fun too. And so we'll be, I'll be putting up Zoom backgrounds behind me of stuff uh, from kind of geek culture that I love, uh, uh, the history of computing, um, video games, science fiction, and anime. And they're, they're gonna be kind of obscure. Some of them people get right away, some of them are gonna be pretty obscure. But whoever the first person is, and you have to, in the chat, you have to say to all attendees, not just the panelists. Actually, that's, you could do it either way. The first person to tell us what it is uh, will win some swag. We'll send you a t-shirt, we'll send you some other cool stuff. So in fact, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and, um, and do the first background real quick, just to show you how it works. Let's see here. I'm gonna stop sharing real briefly and I'm gonna bring up a background. Now I know from the chat already that there are folks who have been to other events we've done. So I'm gonna to try to use mostly ones I haven't used before, but it's tough to just keep finding these. So let's start with, let's start with this one. Okay, so on my Zoom background, is a shot from a science fiction film. And your job is to say what the film is. All right. Okay, uh, Eric Duncan, THX 1138 is the correct answer. We also got iRobot and Tron. No, this is from THX uh, 1138. We had a Logan's run. Oh, I'm sorry, Dale got it before, before I could even see. Wow, this is going by fast. I'm gonna have to let Sylvia help me here. Uh, we had a couple correct responses, but the first one counts. That's Dale. So THX 1138 was George Lucas's first movie. Um, it might be a good movie. It's up to you. All right. Uh, we're going to go back to, to sharing here. Um, okay. Let's jump into uh, one with a scenario that I'm going to build out today is we, we took the masterclass on how to build a highly secure S3 bucket. So the particular scenario that I'm talking about is we're going to have an S3 bucket whose job it is to interact only with compute instances in a particular VPC. In other words, it's a place to store data. It's not a place to share data with the outside world. Only the compute instances in a VPC should be able to interact with that S3 bucket. So it's a pretty narrow use case. There's a million use cases in S3. That's the one I'm gonna be kind of illustrating but then at the end, when we're whiteboarding, we're gonna explore some others. Oops, Zoom's getting in my way here. Let's see, I can move it down here. All right, let's, uh, let's go to S3 and let's start this by, uh, oops, I lost my video, I didn't need to do that. Okay, let's start this by just walking through creating a bucket. So, and we told people uh, in, up front that the level of experience required uh, for, for this class was none. Um, and we're gonna keep to that. So I'm gonna do some very 101 explanation as I go, and I'm also gonna get into really advanced topics. So 
S3 is the simple storage service. You can think of it as a global web server. It stores objects. There are trillions of objects stored in S3. It is incredibly robust. It is incredibly fast and incredibly feature rich. So for example, when you watch Netflix, all that data is coming out of S3. Uh, I've heard it as, as much as a fourth of the public internet. So it is a giant store and disseminate service. All right. The way it's organized is using what are called buckets. A bucket is a kind of container. I think it's kind of like a server, but it's not a server. It's a container that you're using for some particular purpose. And then you put objects in it. You know, you put files in it, right? So what we need to do to start is give it a name. And those names need to be unique. So I'm going to call this the master class demonstration bucket. So that's my bucket name. It's not showing me red, which means I get, by the way, this is not a class on all the features and capabilities of S3. This is a class on how to build secure S3 buckets. All right, so I've given it a name. I do not want to uh, copy settings. And now we're gonna walk through each of these features and what they mean and how you should think about them from a security perspective and how they interact. And I'm going to just go through them in, in order. I had a really hard time figuring out how to structure this, this class, uh, but this definitely seemed the best way. So first of all, versioning. Keep all versions of an object in the same bucket. In other words, when a new version is posted, the old version remains. I generally think this is a good idea. In fact, if you care about the data, it's a good idea. And what I mean by care about the data is, if losing it or having it be corrupted could cause problems. And here you can think of something like uh, ransomware, right? Like if somebody can go in and encrypt your data and then you don't have access to it anymore, boy, is it nice to have versioning turned on because you can just tell them to go away and roll back to the versions prior to them encrypting that. So generally speaking, I recommend this. Now it is going to increase your costs some, but we're this, this, class is about creating secure S3 buckets, not cheap S3 buckets. And you'll find there's tension between those things. So I'm going to go ahead and select versioning. I'm definitely going to turn on access logging. Okay. Um, oh, I should not have chosen that as, uh, let's just go to here. And access logging means we're just going to log the requests to the bucket, much like a web server does. Now, one thing to keep in mind, unlike a local web server, the access logging in S3 is what Amazon refers to and the industry refers to as eventually consistent. You are not going to see this stuff happen in real time. And the amount of time it takes to get that information is going to be pretty variable based on what Amazon are doing with them internally and with their other customers. Object level logging, I strongly re recommend turning this on. So what this is going to do is every call against that S3 bucket to like get an object or put an object in it is going to go to another AWS service called CloudTrail. It usually takes 15 minutes, but it, it can take a day. They don't really have a promise there. So again, this is not useful for uh, real-time knowledge of what's going on, in my opinion. 15 minutes is pretty slow, uh, and next day is way too slow. But you do want those records. It's going to cost you some money. Uh, now, I don't have a CloudTrail enabled for this, but you're going to want to, you can uh, create a CloudTrail, and then you can put read and write events to it. So we, we, would, we would turn those on in a real environment. Hey, Josh, uh, yes. Jeff wants to know what the difference is between S3 logging and CloudTrail object level logging. Yeah, so um, the, let's go to the docs. I'm going to be doing a fair amount of this. So um, you can see right here, server access logging provides for, uh, records for the requests that are made to a bucket. And they're going to be collected up into files that are dumped in another S3 bucket. You can put them in the same one, but 
for lots of reasons, I would separate concerns of what buckets are doing. So if you're hosting content in a bucket, um, I would recommend sending the logs to another bucket because the permissions on those two buckets are, you probably want to be different. So this is like having, uh, you know, tar balls, it is having tar balls of web logs. CloudTrail is more like event at a time hitting a service endpoint so that you can kind of react and respond to that. Um, I believe the information is, is nearly the same between the two. It's how it's getting delivered. Personally, I would use both. That may sound redundant, but what I've learned in using cloud services is actually, unless your data gets really big, it's gonna be cheap. Transference of data is where you tend to get more cost, depending on the service. Um, and having knowing you have data is uh, much better than questioning whether you have data. And with eventual consistency, when you sit down at a particular moment to figure out what has happened in an event, you might find a scenario where that, you know, hourly dump of logs to your S3 bucket is ahead on a bunch of events than CloudTrail. So it, it, gets, it gets interesting. I'm, I'm eyeing time here and I'm actually running slower than I thought I would. So let's, let's do, uh, keep going with, with questions when you have them and I will answer them uh, as briefly as I can because I have a lot of material to get through. All right, um, let's talk about encryption. Encryption is an often confusing topic on S3. There are, so this is showing uh, two kinds of encryption, AES-256 server-side encryption with Amazon S3 managed keys and use server-side encryption with AWS KMS managed keys. There are two other kinds of encryption that are not gonna show here which are client-based encryption, where you're managing the keys and, 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 and encryption. Uh, now, I'm gonna focus on these two because I think this confuses people and is really important to understand. So the uh, AWS S3 managed key encryption, what that is going to do is when those objects are written to disk or whatever they write them to these days, written to persistent storage, they're gonna be encrypted with 100% uh, AWS managed keys. Now what that means is, if anyone has permission, whether it's through IAM or through a bucket policy or through an ACL or through uh, an access point, we'll go through all these. If they can read that object, it will come across unencrypted to them, okay? All they need is read permission. So really this doesn't help you that much with a data breach scenario, if at all. This is really for, in my opinion, little more than checking a box that Amazon can't read the contents of your objects because the, it goes in plain text, it comes out plain text and it's just encrypted on the back end by Amazon. Now you can do server side encryption using AWS managed keys and you can, I don't, I don't have any uh, configured, well, you can, you can use just the, the, the one they kind of give you. Now, this is better for buckets you want to be secure. It's a lot better because to get what the transaction now will do is if I go do a read to that S3 bucket, I also have to include the ability to call KMS to get the key that's available at that time. So you can think of this kind of like multi-factor authentication in a way where I don't just need to crack in to get read access. I also have to get key access in order to pass it in to get the unencrypted data out. So my strong recommendation is uh, always do this with any non-public data. Do not use the uh, AWS S3 managed keys except for checking a box for a compliance framework for public data, okay? Um, in advanced settings, this is a cool feature, uh, object lock. This essentially creates a write once read many object type. So you cannot mutate objects. In other words, we talked earlier about versioning. Here we're talking about, there's no versions. Everything is new. This is critically important if you're doing things like managing uh, public records. What I mean by that are things like, that are legally mandated to be uh, uh, actual records that live for a long time, okay? 
th that's where Worm, Write Once, Read Many, really kind of came from back in the probably 70s at this point. Um, but you can think of it too as insurance that nobody can do any kind of funny injection stuff to your data, right? So when you think about some of the kinds of attacks people might make, they might involve modifying things in your data to include uh, things that are uh, harmful. So if you're serving a website, for example, uh, and somebody wants to do uh, some kind of uh, JavaScript based in, in code injection and they manage to get right access to your objects and mutate them, uh, the next time that web app calls that object, it'll have the same name and it'll now deliver the version that has been, uh, you know, uh, compromised. So it's not a common uh, thing to worry about, but if you're worried about it, this uh, um, object lock is a really, really cool feature. And um, CloudWatch request metrics. So, so AWS has lots of services for keeping track of what's going on, and they're highly variable in how thorough they are and how fast they are and how expensive they are. So CloudTrail, I mentioned earlier, they say it takes about 15 minutes, but it could take longer. It can take a lot longer. CloudWatch is going to be much, much faster, but it's also going to cost you more. So if you're really concerned about the data in that bucket, this is definitely a place uh, to, to turn that on. But do be aware uh, you're going to spend some money to do that. I want to get my chat window back up here because uh, I kind of like to keep it around what's going on too. Yeah, somebody's posting uh, just links into the channel. Here. OK. Um, as a security practitioner, uh, always be uh, cautious of links that appear. Um, Sorry, Dale, trust you by default, but verify. All right, um, let's, let's move on a little bit. Um, that's really what, it, what you need to know about encryption first and foremost, and we're halfway through our hour, so, so I need to speed up, uh, is uh, those KMS managed keys make it much, much harder for bad guys to steal data. Okay, now you are confronted with a wall of text that is going to take us down the rabbit hole the rabbit hole of layers of AWS S3 security. And that is a feature that rolled out, I think in 2019, called Block Public Access. Um, this is going to be the way that we end up needing to explore a whole lot of S3. Because if you read these blocks of text, it gets quite complex. So we have four layers of blocking public access. By the way, you can turn this on at the bucket level, I think at the account level, at the region level, there's a number of levels you can turn it on. And there are four different settings. If you check this top box, it's block all public access. But these other blocks that, that make up block all tell you more about how S3 layered security really works. So we're gonna go uh, spelunk into that. So the first one says, block public access to buckets and objects granted through new access control lists. Okay, five layers of S3 security. The first one, access control lists. Amazon tells you don't use these anymore. Okay, even though every time you create a new S3 bucket, you get one, they tell you they have better ways. But ACLs are uh, access control lists, and you'll, you'll see that they keep getting referred to in here. You might think, well, why is AWS talking about ACLs if they say don't use them anymore? Well, because the service is 14 years old. And ACLs were put on S3 before IAM existed and before these other features existed. And so a lot of folks, I mentioned trillions of objects in S3, a lot of folks have ACLs uh, all on, the, on, their, on their buckets. So the first one is block public access to buckets and objects granted through new access control lists. In other words, if we've already got old public access control lists, they stay public. Only stop people from making new public ones, okay? The next one is block access to buckets and objects granted through any access control list. In other words, all the old ones we've got that were public shut down that public capability. You want to be cautious doing that if you have a large collection of S3, because you might break stuff. 
Okay. Um, block public access to buckets and objects granted through new public bucket or access point policies. Okay. So the first layer is uh, AC, uh, ACLs. Second layer is identity and access management, IAM. Third layer of security on S3 is the bucket policy. The bucket policy is an, uh, actually a form of access control list. This is confusing stuff, folks, and, and you really have to drill into it to understand how these work. But bucket policies work differently than the old school ACLs, but they are your last line of defense for your bucket. We're gonna cover all this stuff, by the way. Fourth is an access point, which can have a policy. I'm gonna hold off on explaining access points for now. I think it's in, uh, uh, important enough just to understand the, those, those first ones on individual S3 buckets versus buckets with access points. And then the fifth one is this thing the block public access. And let's jump over to the block public access documentation because you'll start to see one of the themes of S3, of understanding S3 security is because of all these layers and because of all the history and the complexity, you end up with a lot of like little special cases and little catches to things. So this is just the AWS documentation. Okay, we saw those four I gotta keep moving my window here for Zoom. Uh, we saw those four uh, uh, settings. This, these are, those, those were like the human speak versions. These are the real versions, okay? So uh, block public access, uh, block public ACLs, um, ignore public ACLs. Okay, we're a half an hour in. I'm gonna drill in on this a little bit. So you, you really need to think about, you cannot read the English of the, doc, of, of the interface and think you understand these things. You have to go and look at this detailed documentation. So, because it will tell you literally what's going to happen. So if you have the block public apples on, settings to true causes the following behavior. This is where you find out what's really gonna happen. Put bucket apple and put object apple calls fail if the specified access control list is public. So you could apply ACLs both to buckets and objects in buckets. So a put operation against the bucket or the objects, if it is public, will fail. So it's not gonna let you do that put. That's how you assign an ACL to something. And put object calls fail if the request includes a public ACL. So you can do a put on an object. You can put a new object in S3 and you can kind of stick an ACL on it and say, you know, do these together. So this is its way of saying, like, you, you, that's, that's not an escape around this. You, if you put an, a public thing on it, we're not gonna, we're not gonna allow it. So this block public ACLs is really gonna prevent you from putting new stuff in with public ACLs. Before we keep going, I wanna talk about what is the definition of public, because you probably have the wrong idea. Okay, so let's look here. Amazon S3 considers a bucket or object ACL public if it grants any permissions to members of the predefined all users or authenticated users groups. And when evaluating a bucket policy, S3 begins by assuming the policy is public. That's a good assumption. It, 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 it should assume everything's dangerous. It then evaluates the policy to determine whether it qualifies as non-public. So, we're, we're looking for qualifications for not being public. And if, if we don't hit those quals, we're gonna say it's public, we're gonna block it. Let's look at the list of things that qualify it. So we're saying to, to be considered non-public, a bucket policy must grant access only to fixed values. In other words, no, no wildcards, no stars of one or more of the following. Uh, the very first one, those of you who know what this means, a, a, a set of classless interdomain routings, CIDR blocks. Okay, these are blocks of IP addresses. And they could be very large without any wildcarding, right? You can have very large collections of IP address space that is uh, considered uh, non-public and therefore acceptable. It could be a significant portion of the internet. 
that is allowed in and the block public access will see it as non-public and allow that. So the, the block public access is a very useful feature, but there's no way you should fully trust it that your information won't get leaked onto the internet, even directly, even without people having IAM credentials or other kinds of protections. I'm gonna pause there and do a background. Give me one sec. We have a question for you too while you're changing over backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, Vasily asks, uh, object lock with versioning enabled will not restrict rewriting an object, which is not object modification, but just creation of a new version. Is that correct? I'd have to try it. I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to try it. Um, uh, well, practically there's a way to do that. The question is whether the object name whether the actual URL to the object would, would remain the same. I believe it would not, but I would have to, I've never tried that. I would have to try it. Um, I believe object lock requires the uh, object behind a particular address uh, to never mutate. Whereas versioning allows it to mutate but retains earlier versions. And those are very different things. Okay, one of my favorites. This is one of the most uh, famous keyboards in the history of computing. Um, and you just have to say what kind of keyboard it is. It could be, uh, it's got kind of a nickname, but it also was the keyboard to a particular manufacturer of computer um, that is now uh, famous. Um, it is not IBM, no. It is not Commodore 64. I'll give you some hints. No, it's not DEC. It, it, is, um, it is from a very uh, interesting scientific computer, not TI, uh, no, not SG, it was very expensive, okay? It wasn't a home computer. It's not a Cray, no, we've got some Crays coming in. Um, why some Silicon Graphics, no. No, I'm gonna give it 30 more seconds and then I'll tell you, Deep Blue, no, next, no. Uh, question, question, question mark. <laughs> PDP 11, no. Um, so it's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and call it on this one. We'll do another easier one. I was told last time I did these, do some harder ones. This is kind of a hard one. Um, this is from a, a kind of machine uh, in the 80s that was around called a Lisp computer. And they actually ran the language Lisp as their operating system. The company was called Symbolics. And they called this the Space Cadet Keyboard uh, because it had just uh, Symbolics. Yeah, that's right. The Symbolics Company. All right, I'm gonna do another one real quick because that one was too hard. I, I guess I, I'm, I've gone from uh, maybe one extreme to another. Uh, we'll go to science fiction again. Yes, which, which doctor? Yep, Eric, it's the first doctor, first doctor, way, way back. Okay. Um, if you won before, you can't win again. So I, I know that doctor who uh, the TARDIS was answered by Dale Govier. And uh, so I can't count that. No, no, no. Next... Uh, so we, I said, which one? So it's uh, um, Eric Duncan got first. Eric, off. all right. It's, Doctor Who is too. I mean, there's, there's a TARDIS in it. So right. It, exactly. uh, it, you got to get the version. Eric got the version. I should have said that up front. You should have had the version. So, but, but there, we'll do more. We'll do more. All right. Um, you'll have other chances to win. Okay. Let's go back to what we were talking about. So, so the meaning of public is something get people get confused about, and actually get in trouble over, because they think. Uh, if AWS tells you it's not public, that you have much more safety than you really do. Uh, because again, these could be exposed. I mean, all it says is uh, 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 a list only of only fixed values, it doesn't say how long, of certain object types that can be pretty substantial collections of stuff. So you want to use this feature. I'm not trying to put this feature down. You want to use this feature but you, it's not good enough to use this feature, not even close. Um, you, you have to be careful if you have a large collection of S3 turning on the 
the ones that go back in time and block public access because you might have stuff that's public. And in fact, you might have legitimate use cases for public access, like hosting a website that you want public access. The internet should, if Netflix turned off public access, you wouldn't watch movies, right? So there are legit uses for public, um, but it is a really helpful uh, overlay on top of these, uh, the ACLs and the bucket policies. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it on. Um, and do not grant Amazon S3 log delivery group right access to this bucket. This is a kind of funny little setting. It just means like, should the bucket be able to accept logs? Are you gonna use this bucket for collecting logs? Think back to turning on the S3 logging. You would, you would grant that permission here, right? If you wanted logs to get dumped in here. Uh, but if you're not using this bucket to collect logs, you would leave it here. Okay. Um, so we've now configured all those things. And we're just going to go ahead and create a bucket. And this will take a second. And we can see down here our MC demonstration bucket. I've got to rearrange my screen a little bit. All right. So now we've got a, a bucket. And we have a number of uh, different kinds of things we can do here. Um, we've, we've done block public access. So we, we said we wanted a secure bucket, right? Uh, we can go into properties here. We can see what we've done. We enabled versioning. We enabled default encryption. Um, the server access logging. And uh, we, we didn't turn some of this stuff on because we just didn't have a convenient logging bucket to throw it in. Um, the object lock we talked about. Um, there are other things that are, that are not security related, like request repays and transfer acceleration. But you can see here that S3 is a very complex service with lots and lots of like switches and, and knobs and dials you can, you can use on it. Uh, so there's no way in an hour I can cover literally everything. But what you're gonna get after you go through that first pass is you're gonna get to this uh, screen on this bucket. So if we look at permissions, you can see here we have block public access. You also see access control list. Remember we talked about ACLs. I told you AWS tells you not to use ACLs, but then puts one on the bucket. It does right here by default. And, and that, this is a good thing because you wouldn't be able to access the bucket if it weren't there. The canonical uh, ID of the user, which it says right here, your AWS account is allowed to see the, and, and, and get access to the bucket. Okay. Um, you can do that for other AWS accounts. I would not do that for other AWS accounts. Don't use ACLs, use IAM. Okay. ACLs are really outdated. Now, now it, they need to be able to share it with you locally, and they need to leave that setting on. But I would strongly recommend looking at IAM everywhere that you can. That does not include portions of the public internet. But it does include anything you can point to as a, an Amazon uh, 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 you know, principle or object. So what I mean by that is, I will very briefly here Let's, um, let's pop up an IAM real quick. This isn't a class on IAM, that'll be the next one, but I will just show you very briefly um, how you might do this and, and what I mean by it. So remember, what we're trying to do here is create an S3 bucket that this compute instance can talk to and only compute instances inside this VPC network can talk to. That's our goal. So we don't need any IP CIDR block based access from the outside world. Therefore, we can create a new policy, an IAM policy that grants us access to that S3 bucket. So let's just go to S3 and I'm just gonna do this very briefly. I'm not gonna go spelunking into IAM deeply. Um, one, uh, never use stars in these IAM policies. They're really dangerous. Uh, what I would generally recommend is you can see there's lots of permissions in here. I would avoid the list stuff. If, if all that EC2 instance needs to do, if all that compute or container or Lambda or whatever needs to do is write objects and read objects, and that very often that's the case, um, you need that one. And 
you need that one. That's, that's really what you want. You don't want list. List creates a vulnerability that if bad guys get into that compute, they can go explore your S3 and steal stuff. We actually did a whole demonstration of that. And that's exactly what happened at Capital One, by the way, is they had list turned on by an IAM role. So, so why am I talking about IAM versus ACLs? Well, one, uh, when S3 tells you you really shouldn't do something, you should probably pay attention because they, it means they've done something that's much better, more effective, and more in depth. Okay, I'm, I definitely, uh, <laughs> uh, this is the first time we've done this and I thought I'd fit it all into an hour, but uh, so don't use ACLs, use IAM. There's two other topics I wanna cover and then I wanna leave a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. I don't think we're gonna get to whiteboarding today, but we'll see. If, you, if folks wanna stick around and whiteboard, happy to do it. Um, but these bucket policies are really, really important. So when you're using IAM, and you should, the IAM role is going to determine the access to the uh, bucket itself. But IAM is another service, and things can get added to it without you knowing about it. Also, bad guys can do things like change what IAM roles they're using. So it's not adequate to think that your IAM role that you attach to that compute instance to talk to the S3 bucket is good enough. You also wanna do as much kind of final line of defense work as you can using the bucket policy. By the way, this is, this is also where you would typically do things like um, grant access to public blocks of IP addresses and so on. I'm just gonna briefly show you how you would um, restrict, remember I said, um, we only oh, I went too far. Uh, we only want stuff inside this VPC to be able to talk to that bucket, right? Well, you see right here, this is what's called a VPC endpoint. VPC E tech, la 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 la, uh, deb C zero. Over here, you can see in my code editor, I am saying that we should deny everything unless it is coming from that VPC endpoint. So we now have two of the layers interacting here, right? The, the layers we have are we have the IAM role. And in this case, we have this EC2 instance. It could be anything. It could be any kind of compute. Is running using this S3 read write IAM instance profile, OK? So it is operating with credentials that should give it read write access according to IAM to that S3 bucket. Now, because it lives, it is connecting to that S3 bucket. You can see it here on the FugViz very simply through this endpoint. That's where it's reaching out to it. Um, the IAM permissions will say yes, will say allow, because it has those permissions, as I just showed you. And then the bucket policy will then be analyzed. And it will also allow, because it will find the condition uh, source VPCE of this string. And this is an important thing to understand about these five layers of security is they are always going to uh, sort down to least privileged. So you, you put another way, as you go through these five layers, if you hit any deny, it will fail. So what does that mean? What that means in this case is let's say a bad guy got in to this EC2 compute instance and collected credentials for the S3 read write IAM role, which is entirely feasible. If they can break into there, they can probably get the temporary rotating credentials, right? And then they go and use those from somewhere on the internet to access that S3 bucket to suck all the data out. Well, if that bucket policy weren't there, they would be able to do that. But because we're gonna put that bucket policy on that bucket, we're, they'll get a deny, right? Because the bucket policy at the end says, hey, unless it's coming from this endpoint, deny it. There's tons of stuff you can put in bucket policies. You can put time constraints. You can put all kinds of different principles in there. Uh, they're very, very powerful. You should always, always, always have bucket policies in addition to IAM, even in use cases that are purely private. Uh, okay, we're into the last 10 minutes. There's one more thing I do have to touch on. I'm gonna to touch on it briefly, and then we'll have some uh, uh, Q&A. And I'll do another background too. So um, I'm not gonna worry about cores. That's for building websites and allowing access across them for scripting. 
don't, I'm not going to worry about that today. It's more functionality than security, but I do want to tell you about access points. So access points are okay. So if you think about our scenario, uh, we have a simple use case. We have an S3 bucket and a compute instance, and those two things and only those two things need to interact. But what if you had, for example, um, you were a collection of scientists on the one side generating data about the pandemic and pushing that into an S3 bucket. And then you wanted the world to be able to retrieve that data. Okay, so you now have two use cases, two sets of permissions. What you can do is attach what are called access points onto the S3 bucket and have different ones. And you target that, so one for the scientists, one for the public, and probably one for you know, the owner of the actual S3 bucket. Now, going back to public access, you'll remember that some of those were on access points too. So these things get complex. I'm running out of time. Um, but uh, access points, the only time you need to think about access points are when you have multiple different sets of restrictions on data in the same S3 bucket. Uh, generally speaking, um, I would recommend that if you have data that has different kinds of access privilege requirements on it, that you have more than one bucket. But, but that is, um, uh, that is uh, uh, there for that, that particular use case. All right, I'm going to do um, one more background. While you're doing that, I uh, had a question from Vahid that's kind of more of a meta question about AWS security in general, but this one's specific about uh, S3. Wondering why AWS does not incorporate all of these security functionalities as default to make configuration more simple, because the more choice you have, the more opportunities for mistakes you can make, and then there are more holes for the bad actors to attack your data. But that, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so one, I've got a background up. You have to uh, tell me, uh, tell us what kind of computer. Uh, I'm going to be answering the question um, and uh, let Drew and Sylvia, they, they know the answer. Um, so um, the, uh, the, the short version of that is, I mean, if you think about a service with trillions of objects that's been around for 14 years and that probably serves at least a fourth of the internet, um, there really is no default that makes sense. It can do so many things. It's so powerful and it's so flexible that it, you really have to understand the use cases. You really have to understand how it works in order to do what you want. So um, with uh, power comes responsibility, right? And so S3 is extraordinarily powerful and therefore has a lot of complexity. Now, because it has a lot of features to do things that you might not need to do, but that Netflix might need to do, or that we might need to do. So if you take anything away from today, it is uh, understand there are five layers and that you can probably avoid ever using two of them. Those are ACLs and access points. You probably don't need to care about those things. The areas you should focus on are IAM, and that's going to be our next deep dive, is helping you understand how to do that properly, and bucket policies. Those are really what you need to care about. The, the uh, block public access is kind of this meta wrapper. It really is its own separate thing. Oh, oh, uh, bo, 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 I think, is Ken the first one to say Amiga? Because that's an Amiga. Uh, yes, that is Ken then. Yep. Do we have, yes, I know somebody said they can Google the answer. You know, you can Google stuff, but you know, um, I'll, I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Sivia uh, deal with the, the guessing order. Um, so we did have a question though. Um, do we have a shareable secure S3 bucket creation CloudFormation template or know of any on GitHub, et cetera. Um, you know, we, we, we don't have like, here's a good secure S3 bucket because what that means is gonna be different based on use case. What I just showed you 
um, will work for its particular use case. But for other use cases, you'll have different, very different requirements. What I just showed you, and I'm, I'm happy to share it, right? Uh, all you need to do, um, we, we tend to focus more on Terraform and CloudFormation, but it, it's all the same. Um, but with Fugue, you can actually, we have a tool that lets you check your template in Terraform before you launch it, as well as monitor the production runtime for secure settings. Um, you know, if you want a bucket as locked down as what I just showed you, which is really, really locked down, like only one VPC can access it, and um, it only talks about IAM, and it has, it has no opportunity for public uh, IP addresses to be open, that's pretty simple to do. Um, it's, it's when you get into the nuances of like, well, wait a minute, it needs to talk to another AWS account in a different region. And by the way, we want to connect via uh, to this CIDR block for, uh, you know, something outside of the cloud where things start getting tricky. So the, the short answer is, and the reason we're teaching this class, you cannot learn this by purely by example and imitation. You have to understand how it works. And, and I hope that this was a, a good introduction to uh, understanding how these things work. Obviously, uh, I, I actually had a whole bunch more material, uh, but an hour is just not long enough. Maybe if there's interest, we'll do a part two for S3. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll see. All right, I'll do one more background here. Let's switch gears. Okay, I'm hearing uh, via the chat, yes, there is interest for part two. Okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. This is, this is literally the first masterclass session we've ever done. So it's very pleasing to hear that because uh, a lot of times the first time you try something, uh, you, you, you get it a little wrong and uh, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, a bunch of them. All right, um, I got a background. Uh, this is a kind of obscure anime. So I'm going outside of the, outside of the big ones here. Uh, but I know we got a bunch of people who've been on these sessions before, and so I'm gonna pull up a new one. And Josh Christian wants to know if you have any recommendations on scanning tools to detect S3 misconfigurations. Why I've spent several, Drew and I have spent several years of our lives and our whole team's building what we think is, is, is by far uh, the best in class for this. Um, the visualizations I was showing you come from it. I mean, this is not a, a you know, sales pitchy uh, demo, but that's what we do at Fugue all day long. And uh, you can get it for free forever at small scale. It's open source then. We do have, uh, somebody uh, said, is, is, is Fugue open source? Um, we do have uh, uh, open source projects out there, two, uh, three, three big ones. One is called Regula for, um, uh, for uh, uh, scanning Terraform templates and so on. Uh, one is uh, called Frego. Uh, so Fugue uses Open Policy Agent and uh, uh, not thinking of the third one now. So we have open source, but Fugue itself is a SaaS. So you just go to fugue.co. Uh, and you can sign up and the developer version is free forever and you get, um, you get uh, the, all the visualization I was showing you. We will show you where you have weaknesses. We'll paint them red and tell you how to fix them. And um, yeah, we hope you like it. Okay, I think we got a winner there. I believe Nick was the first to get it right. So let me scroll back up. Yeah, it was Nick. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a it's an anime called Fooly Cooly F L C L. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a it's an odd duck, uh, but is kind of famous among uh, anime fans, uh, of, of whom I am one. So I think we're we're kind of at the top of the hour. Um, please also talk about the cost. So somebody's asking. Please also talk about the cost. How can we decrease? Using AWS for the companies at the end of the day, all is a matter of cost, even for the most important data. Okay, look, the more secure you want your data, the more you're going to spend to store it, as a general rule. As a general rule. So if it's all about cost, you're saying you don't care that much about security. You, there's, there's a tension between those two things. It is unavoidable. So when you think about things like versioning, and you think about things like using strong encryption, uh, these things increase the amount of resources used to store and retain that data. 
So um, how do you reduce cost? Um, you, you can reduce cost by reducing reliability. There are tiers. This session is not about cost management. Um, you can reduce access. You can reduce security. There are a number of things you can, you can choose to give up. But, um, you know, the world, it's a lot of my background is in national security kinds of things where, you know, security mattered more than cost. And so I tend to be quite paranoid. And what I was trying to teach you today is how to make something that's safe, not cheap. And those will be at, at, at odd. Oh, Dale, Dale knew what it was, but he already won. Um, could we talk about the difference in between uh, Fugue and Cloud Custodian. Sure, um, so there are a lot of differences. So Fugue's whole approach is we collect literally all the configuration information of a cloud infrastructure environment. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Um, what things like Cloud Custodian or, uh, you know, I don't know, Dome 9 or Palo Alto are doing is, is much more limited than what we're doing. So what, what we're doing is uh, you can see right here. Uh, so this is this is the Fugue interface. It's all available via API as well. You tell Fugue to go examine an environment. And by the way, we can examine source code too in, in Terraform uh, at the plan level. And we're going to collect everything about that resource. So we we know every single aspect of all those resources in that environment. And therefore, we can do different kinds of computation against that as an overall model. So if I look at a larger environment, this will be a little clearer. Um, you can get a complete mapping of everything and all of its relationships. And therefore, we're aware of the context. We're not just a simple rules checking engine. We're uh, actually a state machine that is aware of everything going on in that account uh, and how those things interrelate and what the uh, potential security risks across those are. And we're also a queryable uh, data backend for knowing all those configurations over time. So I'm showing this to you visually. Uh, we also have just far more uh, and deeper and richer rules checking than anyone else. So you can see all these, if you're interested in compliance frameworks, uh, we do a few best practices. I could go on and on. I, wanna, I don't wanna turn this into a, a big sales meeting, but there's, there's lots of differences between what we do and, and, and what anyone else does. And, and again, you get all this stuff for free at a, at a small scale, free forever at a, at a small scale. Great. Hey, uh, Bahid has another question that I think gets to a topic that, that we talk about a lot here, um, you know, with our, our customers, is that, that kind of tension between the business and security on spending. And, you know, traditionally, it is a trade-off, um, but, but I think we, we see in the cloud that trade-off is, is you know, possible to kind of at least mitigate and make go away. Yeah, yeah. So, so there are different places where security and cost have been at odds. Okay. So um, the, the biggest one is not how much you're paying Amazon for S3. The biggest one is the organizational impact of applying strong security standards to the development process by far. That blows away infrastructure cost in terms of where you're spending on security. So examples of that include when I was working in national security, we would build a system, we would think we were building it securely. And then uh, at the end of the process, the security team will come and say, rewrite this whole thing and you can't use that database. And we'd go back and do rework and so on and so forth. And very often uh, in national security, that national security, the security wins, right? System doesn't ship. Spend thousands of, you know, man days doing all the stuff to make it secure. But that friction in the process of um, building secure things is, I believe, fundamentally the biggest cost of security. Well, we can totally fix that on cloud. So that what we recommend you do is, and Fugue is built to do this, as you're writing Terraform code, and then as you're deploying to the dev environment, and then as you're going to stage, and long before you get to production, your uh, few can be returning to your developers as part of the software development lifecycle information on what they need to fix to make stuff secure. And so instead of having this big ungainly process, just like a, your, your compiler will tell you if you're making a logical error in your code, Fugue will tell you if you're making a security error in your infrastructure environment. 
And we could not do that before because uh, the infrastructure was all artisanally manually built. Well, now it's all built via API and it's all queryable via API. So I personally believe that using cloud will allow us to build vastly more secure systems than the data center ever would if we do it right. And that means addressing the APIs and using the tools of software programmers to do security. And that's exactly what, what we do. So I hope that answers the question. It's kind of broad. Uh, I got some other questions about like comparing us to particular competitors. Uh, I mean, broadly, nobody else takes the approach we do with baselines. We actually can do self-healing infrastructure too, where um, if you tell us to, we know that whole configuration, we capture that whole baseline. None of the other guys do that. You know, cloud conformity, cloud checker, none of those guys do that. None of those folks do that. No other vendor does this. And then we also have a state engine and the ability to revert to known good. So an example of that would be if somebody were to break into a compute instance due to like a known CVE or something and change the IAM role to get to S3 buckets they shouldn't have access to, Fugue would alert on that and or you could tell Fugue, just change it back so they can't steal data. None of the other folks have these capabilities and it's because they're all really just scan and report tools, like old school, you know, make a list of rules, check against the rules, Fugue is a full state machine of everything in your cloud. And so it's just, it's just radically more powerful. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go on. A, if, if anyone's interested, we'd be happy to do a meeting with you and, and, and like give you the, the demo and all that. But this, this is really, you know, I don't want to turn this into that. Yeah. Well, Tim says auto remediation thumbs up. So. Awesome. Yeah. Never fully secure unless it is air gapped and has no power plug. That's correct. Uh, the most secure computer is one that is turned off. Uh, so uh, we all know that, but we're all deciding where. And, 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 and that brings up an interesting point, at least interesting to me. When I see these cloud breaches reported in the press, they, they're almost always reported wrong. And, 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 and the reason I bring this up is the press almost always says somebody left an S3 bucket public. Mm -mm, I don't buy it. I don't believe that's true most of the time. In the examples I've seen, it has not been true, in fact. So when you think about it, in, in other words, the bad guys are cleverer than that, and they're using kind of uh, multi-part attack vectors to get to that data. They're exploiting IAM, or they're exploiting other pieces of your infrastructure to get to that, that data in S3. It's not like just somebody said, oh, I'll have a public ACL, on, and I'll put all my HR data in it. I, I mean, that's probably happened, but I think that's rare. And so the, the, the notion that you can't be secure um, for, from a practical perspective is I think wrong. From a pragmatic perspective, you can be secure relative to the value of your data. Um, we can do it with, with APIs and cloud better than we could ever do it before. Um, however, you have to understand how it works. And you have to understand where the bad guys are you're using cracks in the complexity of the infrastructure to get access to it. And I mean, that's why we exist as a company is we tell you that stuff. So, um, uh, but the other point there is turning on block public access. If you sleep well at night, cause you click that box, you should not be. That is not the main attack vector to stealing data out of S3. It's good. They put it in there. It's a good, it's, it's a, okay, it's a good feature, but it just doesn't solve most of the breaches. Uh, that was weird. What did my, uh... I am not seeing any more questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because uh, my Mac decided to pop up my email client. <laughs> No, we see your background and oh okay i see you yeah yeah awesome okay well maybe we should move to wrap um if anybody has any additional questions or thinks of any uh you can reach out to us i'm drew at fugue.co and josh is josh at fugue.co uh we'd love to connect with you uh, again it looks like based on uh, the reaction we got that we might be doing a uh 
uh, a part two of, of an S3 security deep dive masterclass. Uh, would love to see you next week. Uh, join our conversation with Greg McCord from Calamp and later in June as we go deep on the uh, security of AWS IAM. Um, it will be awesome. And uh, thanks so much to everybody for joining us. This was fun. You uh, were a part of our kickoff masterclass. So uh, really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Take care.